I want to start off first by acknowledging a couple of my coworkers, Stephanie Estrella, who's really done a lot of the, well, I'd probably say pretty much all of the day-to-day uh, -day work on keeping this thing running, and Charlotte Milling, who worked with us for several years. She's now working on a PhD program in South Idaho with pygmy rabbits. So uh, with that, uh, so type in hard rock. I mean, there have been a lot of studies looking at stream temperature and effects of forest practices on stream temperature. This one really is looking at uh, you know, headwater streams, uppermost point of perennial flow down to the last fish point, and also a unique set of uh, riparian uh, buffer strategies. And so our, our overall objective here is really to estimate the effect of uh, timber harvest using these three different buffer strategies on stream cover and water temperature. So what did we actually measure? So for stream cover, we did it two different ways. One is we took hemispherical photos at 10 locations along the main channel in the stream, and from those, we calculated two metrics. One was what we called canopy and topographic density. So if you imagine this hemisphere, it's the proportion of that hemisphere that is obscured by canopy or trees or topography. Um, and then effective shade looks at that same uh, hemispherical photo, but it looks just at the solar path for a particular time of the year. What we'll present here today is in the summertime, and looks at the proportion of solar energy that's blocked along that solar path, the proportion that is not reaching the stream, and that's what we're calling effective shade. Uh, at the same time, in the same locations, we also used a densiometer and looked, took uh, measurements, you know, upstream, downstream, left, right, left bank, right bank, bank at one meter height, and then we did that again right at the water surface. And the one at the water surface was really there to catch um, uh, shading provided by slash and debris that's introduced into the stream after harvest. And then in addition to that, we looked at stream temperature. We used um, onset tidbits with 30-minute uh, intervals, so we measured every 30 minutes. Left these in year-round from the beginning of the study till the end, and we deployed these in multiple locations in all 17 sites. So specifically, what are we looking at? This is, so here are two basins here. The, the divide is right through here. Here's forest practices buffer here in the South Cascades. So last fish is down here, and then the uh, shade measurements were taken all along this main channel here at equally spaced intervals from the pip all the way down to the last fish. Likewise, here is a, uh, the 0% buffer, and we did them along here both pre and post harvest, two years pre and at least two years post. Uh, shade measurements were taken at some locations, at least four locations in each one of these basins. These were at the last fish point here uh, where we thought the upper part of this buffer, somewhere in this buffer where the buffer would be in the forest practices um, treatment, and somewhere within this clear cut area and then as close as possible as we could to the pip. And in the other ones, we kind of approximated where those would be and strung these out along there at you know, roughly you know, similar intervals. And then in addition to those, we also monitored here at the mouth of any tributary that was coming into, or any perennial tributary coming into that main stem, we monitored those as well. So for the analysis with the stream cover data, we simply took those 10 measurements, took a mean of those measurements, and then took that mean for each site for each year, and then fed that into a, a general, generalized least, uh, least squares mixed effects model analysis of variance. And uh, so effectively, you had one value per site per year, so about two sites pre-harvest, or two, yeah, two observations for each site pre-harvest and two observations post-harvest. Uh, for the temperature, it gets a little more complicated. So we did, first we had to calculate a temperature metric, and we wanted to try to get this as accurate as possible. So what we did initially was calculated a, a site scale daily temperature response. Um, following some methods, you know, outlined in, in Watson et al. and Gomi et al. and then improved a lot, you know, through talks with Greg, uh, Greg Stewart here. And what we did there was we used the pre-harvest data, so up to two years pre-harvest data, and fed that into a generalized least squares regression model. So actually, in this case, we're looking at maximum daily temperature in the treatment, looking at that as a function of temperature in the reference basin, and uh, these are seasonal terms to try to pick up some of that natural seasonal variability. And then in addition, we tossed in an autoregressive moving average term to account for reduce that autocorrelation that you'll always find in these daily time series data. So we did that for each location, again, at least four locations in each of the treatment watersheds, compared those to a reference watershed. And we used that model then to predict 
temperature, what the temperature would have been like in that treatment stream in the absence of harvest. So here it is pre-harvest. Red is what we, the temperature we observed in the treatment stream. Blue is what we predicted. So in this pre-harvest period, you can see they're right on top of one another. It's a very good model. Post-harvest here, you can see there's some divergence where the observed temperature is quite a bit higher at certain times of the year than the predicted. So the, what we then did is took the observed temperature, subtracted out the predicted temperature, and that's what we called our daily temperature response, or TR. And if you plot out TR over time, you can see pre-harvest period, it's low, it's always very low, and it hovers around zero. Not exactly zero, but hovers around zero. This is the period when it was being harvested, and you see post-harvest, certain times of the year, it diverges by a lot, and you're up to, you know, five, six, seven degrees in this particular site. So looking at it this way makes that temperature res response much more obvious than looking at the, at the actual temperatures itself. So if we plot those daily responses for the, or the daily treat, uh, temperature response for the, just the uh, post-harvest years, you can see, and this is again one particular site, this was a 0% site, and I'm putting this up for illustration reasons. But you see the red here are the daily responses plotted by month or uh, you know, by calendar month, and then these blue values here are mean values by month uh, with 95% confidence intervals around there. So one way to interpret this is if your response is, you know, if your confidence intervals do not cross this dashed line, which is zero, you could say that's a significant response if you want to look at p-values. So I'd encourage you more to look at, at patterns that you see, and here it's really obvious. In the wintertime, there's not much difference. Increases to a max in July and August. And then back again in the winter time, there's not much difference. So the daily temperature response is really respon most responsive in the hot summer months, which is pretty much what you'd expect. So the second part of the temperature analysis is then we took this seven-day average temperature response and we fed that into that mixed effects model analysis of variance. <coughs> so let's go through and look at some results here. Um, this is uh, from the canopy photos. Here on the left is the canopy and topographic density. Here it explains which uh, treatment we're looking at. And these are the individual mean values for each of the individual sites. And you can see this is pre two years pre-harvest, one year pre-harvest, first year post, second year post. And you can see initially all of these are very tightly clustered. I mean, all the, the uh, prior to harvest, they're all very similar. This was after the uh, windstorm in December 2007, and you can particularly see this is the Willapa 1 reference. It got hit pretty hard, and you can see it's down below the other reference sites for the remainder of the study. Uh, but the others you can see are, are still fairly, a little more noise in there, but they're still tightly clustered. Post-harvest, again, just as you'd expect, the zero percents are much lower. These uh, blue plus signs, the forest practices are a little higher than that, and the hundred percents are a little lower, but not much. Effective shade, the numbers are different, but the pattern's really the same. Zero percents are very low after harvest. Uh, forest practice in the middle, 100 percent somewhere up here, but uh, in the reference sites are fairly tight, except for that one that got hit by the wind throw here. Uh, densiometers. Uh, again, if you look at densiometer, again, we took that at one meter height, and then we also took it down to the water's surface. You look at it at one meter height, and results are still very similar to what we saw with the, with the canopy photos. Uh, you get in here to canopy closure here at zero meters, you begin to see the effects of the slash that was deposited in the stream along those unbuffered reaches. So this really only, only had an effect in the unbuffered portions of the forest practices uh, sites and the zero percent buffered sites. And you can see uh, canopy closure at zero meters um, is much higher than the canopy closure at one meter. Again, that just reflects the, the slash in the stream. And it wasn't like it was everywhere, it was always covered, but there were places that did have a substantial amount of slash. Likewise, the forest practices uh, sites are a little higher at the zero percent, or in the, at, measured at the uh, water surface than they are here measured at one meter. And if you look at the hundred percent, they are also higher. Um, feeding these into the analysis of variance, you can see, again, we're going to see similar patterns here. The canopy and topographic density, 100% buffer, it decreases 7 to 8%. Forest practices down around 20%, and 0% decreases about 40%. I should explain how to interpret these. So 
these are actually looking, there's a pairwise comparisons of, of the treatments. So to read this in this first block here, this is comparing the 100% buffer, how much it changed post-harvest relative to the reference. So the way to read these is this is below zero, so this decreased about 7 to 8%. Uh, forest practices are, you know, decreased 15 to 20%. And these are means, mean values with 95% confidence intervals. So again, if you want to interpret that uh, with respect to p-values, if these confidence intervals don't cross this line there, then the p-value is less than uh, 0.05. So bottom lines with uh, canopy and topographic density, yes, there was an impact even in the 100% buffer. It wasn't big, but it was there and it was measurable. Likewise, with effective shade, you know, it was roughly the same as canopy and topographic density, but it was there and forest practices was substantially lower and 0% zero zero was much lower again, like you'd expect. These panels over here compare the treatments to themselves. So the forest practices versus the 100%, zero versus 100%, and this compares to zero versus the forest practices. Or are those treatments substantially different from each other? Um, going into the densityometer measurements, again, the, at uh, one meter, the results are very similar. There's a little more noise around the, around the numbers that's reflected in these wider confidence intervals, but the pattern's pretty much the same with slight changes in uh, the 100%, slight decrease there, about 20% in forest practices and up to 70 or 80% here in the 0% post-harvest. And you get down to what's actually happening at the water's surface. And you can see there's really not much difference between the 100% uh, the and the forest practices buffer. These are much closer than they were up here. And the 0% is much higher in the differences between the 0% and either the forest practices or the 100% or, the or the forest practices are much lower than they were up here. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at, at the results from the temperature. Now, one thing this study has that really, well, let's talk about the backy design. Um, one of the fatal flaws you see in some backy design is you've got a poor reference. Everything needs to be done to the reference or the control basins, and if you've got a poor control, then your design really falls apart. And, but this study here really had, because we had multiple references or multiple unharvested basins, it gave us an opportunity to really look at reference to reference differences. So, when I say uh, bad reference, that can be manifest in a couple of ways. One is you've, uh, there's not a good correlation between your reference and your treatment, or the other is your reference is kind of wandering off on a track all by itself. So if your reference is changing over time, regardless of what your treatment does, it's going to look like it's changing too. But this gave us an opportunity to look at this idea of stationary. Are my, are my references stationary with respect to each other and with respect to the treatment basins? And it also gives us a chance to look at this idea of looking at significant, statistically significant differences versus what's really meaningful in the context of the natural variability out there. So what we did was, so let's we'll talk a little bit about the study. Originally we came into this with five blocks and five references. Well early on uh, we found out that this Willapa II, one of the treatment sites in the Willapa II was not going to be harvested. So we kept it in there and kept it as a second reference, which was a very good thing. Because here in Willapa I Basin, uh, the, the uh, reference basin got hit hard, very hard, during that December 2007 windstorm. They had a lot of wind throw, and I think as a result of that, the model fit between that, between the treatment basins in that block and that uh, reference were not very good. So we did not use that. I simply used another reference here in the Willapa II for those sites. Willapa III, the reference basin there just happened to be on a different track all together. I mean, it was much colder than the other streams. The variability of the dieval uh, range of temperatures, whether you look at it on a daily basis or an annual basis, was much lower. And the stream went subsurface a lot of the way, so a lot of it was probably hyperaic and groundwater was keeping that stream very cold. But bottom line, it, had a, it was a very poor reference, had a poor model fit, so we didn't use that one. But that still left us with four reference basins here, two of them in these Willapa blocks, one in the South Cascades and one in the Olympics. And so what I did was picked out one of these references in the Willapa block, used that, and did the same analysis comparing uh, the other references to this one reference to see, are these things stable over time? So I went through the same, same process we just talked about and calculated this daily treatment effect. And what we'd hope to see is in this pre-harvest period, you see this uh, 
daily temperature response be small and hovering around zero, which in this case it is. And uh, you know, we had about five years of data, I should explain this. Five years of data, I simply split it in the middle, called the first half pre-harvest, second half I called post-harvest, and ran through the model that way. And so the first two and a half years with the model, it's all hovers around zero. And these are multiple sites within the same reference basin. But they're all fairly low, model around zero. It's not really going in any particular direction. And post-harvest, we see the same thing. And that's exactly what we wanted to see. Then I went in and uh, also calculated these mean monthly TRs on these same sites. And you can see what again, what I'd hope to see is the mean values would be fairly low. And these confidence intervals would, most of them would include zero. And that's pretty much what we see, right? Very tight confidence intervals. Some of them don't include zero, but we've also got a lot of comparisons here. So you'd expect a few of them there. But overall, we're not seeing this, this, any of these reference sites drift off into the distance. And uh, again, that's what we were really, really worried about at first. So I'm confident that these reference sites are good. The model fits that we used were all good. The reference sites are stable. And when we look at, and we talk about significant versus meaningful response, I think we need to kind of look at, at some of these. You know, here we have some significant, you know, statistically significant response for individual months. But these numbers are all below 0.05 when you look at them. 0.05 degrees, some of them are below, some of them are above. And so, you know, I think you could, you could make a cutoff here of about 0.05 degrees on one of these. It's probably, if it's less than that, it, you know, it may just be an aberration or, or some spurious result. If it's more than that, it's probably real, particularly if you see a pattern of rising temperatures over a period of months and then uh, decreasing there in the fall. So um, again, we monitor a lot of sites in these. There's probably upwards of 60 or 70 locations throughout the watersheds. Uh, some of these we, and, and then we ran this analysis on all of them. Some of them we weren't able to include in here because, um, you know, these streams are small, particularly in the summertime. You know, they're this wide and some of them are a centimeter deep. And keeping a tidbit underwater for the entire year is difficult. Um, so we have about 40 some in here that we had uh, a lot of, enough pre-harvest data, enough post-harvest data included the entire year that we could run this analysis on. So what I did was took all the sites where we had available data and I just picked a summer month, in this case July, and I categorized each one of these sites. Was the, you know, was the mean value here above zero? Was it positive or negative, increasing or decreasing? And was this confidence interval, did it include zero or not? If it included zero, I said there was no change. If it was positive and didn't include zero, called it increasing. If it was negative, didn't include zero, I called it decreasing. And then just classified them that way. And then look at them by treatment. And you can see overwhelmingly there were increases in temperature all across the board. So, you know, the 100%, 12 of the sites we had increases, 12 of the locations within the treatment basins were increasing, two of them with no change. Forest practices, it was eight increase, two decrease, one no change. 0%, it was 15, 1, and 2 for increase, decrease, and no change. So overwhelmingly, the temperatures are going up across the board, and this is throughout the watersheds. Um, so then you ask, how much are they going up? You know, how far, you know, how high are they going up? And the question kind of, the answer to that question really depends on where you look. So again, we're looking everywhere from the pip down to last fish point. And I'd say one generalization you can make is the closer you get to the PIP, the more variable results. Some of the, of the sites that were very near a PIP, we saw big increases in temperature. A lot of them we saw nothing. And uh, probably the majority of them, we saw just really variable response. Sometimes it was high, sometimes it was low, but it was hard to predict. And you have to remember again, this is the, you know, this is the first expression of water. So there's barely enough water in the channel to cover the tidbit. And so it's really responsive to, to uh, just more groundwater coming through or, uh, you know, against a small puddle. If it's in the direct sunlight for a short period out of the day, it can heat up very quickly unless there's a lot of water moving through. And so there are a lot of variables affecting it. But higher up in the watershed, the more variable it is. Uh, what I wanted to do today is present results from a couple of different locations. The first was, when we went into the study, we had imagined we'd have these all laid out and everybody, the harvest would go right down to that last fish point and everything would just proceed exactly as we had planned. Well, it didn't quite work that way. <clears throat> For example, in this case, uh, you know, the buffer went in, everything looked good, just a 100% buffer site. The last fish point was down here 
And actually this temperature monitor here is right down here at the last fish point, but it's inside, there's a fish bearing stream down here that this flows into and the buffer from this fish bearing stream extends up past where our first temperature monitor was. So in effect, this is inside of a pretty large buffer. So in a case like that, you know we had some other sites where unstable slope buffers might have precluded harvest over some part of the watershed. And so we had some of these uh, temp uh, monitors down at the last fish point were actually inside a buffer that was much, much wider than 50 feet. So we did the analysis in two places. One's we're interested in what, what happened, you know, what's being delivered into fish bearing water. So we did the analysis on, you know, down here at this FN break, regardless of what it looked like. And then we also selected another set of sites that we thought best represented that treatment. In this case, you know, instead of here, we just went upstream to the next one, and T2 represents, um, you know, 100% buffer very well. We did this on, this really happened on six of our treatment sites, where we just went upstream, picked the next site up that best represented the treatment. So we'll be presenting the analysis of the variance results from two different sets of sites, one from last fish, and then uh, that's here. And then uh, we'll have one from the site that best represents that buffer. So again, these are similar to those analysis of variance plots I showed before, where this shows the uh, temperature response. What did the temperature do post-harvest compared to pre-harvest conditions? So 100% temperature went up about 0.9 degrees. And again, these are 95% confidence intervals. These are uh, the filled uh, dots are post year one, uh, post year two is in the uh, open dots. So uh, again, these results are all pretty consistent. You have uh, temperature went up slightly, again, about 0.9 degrees and 100%, about 1.4 in forest practices and about 3.1 in 0%, which is kind of what we'd expect. Uh, these are, at, you know, uh, second year, I think one other thing that was very consistent across here, a second year the temperature dropped at all of these in all the treatments, slightly, but, but uh, it did drop. So it probably shows some you know, recovery back to pre-harvest conditions. And again, you're looking at differences among the treatments, the forest practices is not much different than 100%, 0% is a little warmer than either of them. So if we go, now we're gonna move upstream to that point that you know, is right below the, the uh, harvest unit. And the differences here, I mean, forest practice is the same because that didn't affect any of the forest practices sites. 100% buffer, the treatment response was, or the temperature change was a little bit higher, it was about 1.2 degrees <coughs> first year post-harvest. And in the 0%, it was about 3.4. But again, it's the same, you know, pretty much the same pattern. Most of these were decreasing in the second year. Forest practice isn't really any different than uh, then uh, the 100% and 0% is, you know, changed more than either one of them. So um, what do we take from all this? Well, the temp the cover, you know, the looking at stream cover, I think we can say that they all pretty much performed as expected. The values among the different metrics we looked at are different, but they're really pointing the same direction. Um, and it's pretty consistent with what you see in other studies. I think the one thing to look at and that probably affects some of these temperature responses is that uh, stream cover from slash in those uh, unbuffered portions of the 0% treatment and in the forest practices treatment. I won't get into the specific percents on these because nobody will remember them anyways. Um, I think with temperature, uh, one conclusion is overall, I mean, looking at the entire watershed from top to bottom, I mean, most of the sites did increase to some degree. The degree really depended on the, on the treatment and then on some site-specific factors that probably have to do with groundwater, hyperrake flow, how much of the stream was really exposed above there, because some of these streams do go subsurface and then come back up. Um, but overall, most, you know, a lot of these good portions of these streams, the majority of the sites we monitor did go up after harvest. And the, uh, um, the degree that they went up, at least down at the lower end, really fell in with uh, you know, the 100% and the forest practice not being very different from one another and the 0% being quite a bit higher. But there were you know, significant and substantial increases in all of them. And with that, do we have time for questions? Okay.